Um, hello, everybody. I'm very sorry that I cannot uh, be with you in person, uh, but um, somehow I managed to to get coronavirus, so I'm <laughs> locked down in in my apartment. Um, I will do my best to make this um, presentation interesting, also in in this online uh, way. Also, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, I'm open to discussion. Uh, we can make this discussion also between the slides, or if you prefer to wait until the end uh, of the presentation, uh, we can have a discussion um, at the end. It really depends um, on you. Um, I haven't been with you in the morning and also in other uh, days, so I don't have a feeling how um, this event uh, is actually um, organized. Um, personally, um, yeah, as I was introduced, uh, I'm a researcher. Uh, I'm already senior researcher, meaning that I've been involved in several European projects. Uh, we started with FP6 and then FP7 um, Horizon. Um, 2020 and now Horizon Europe project. Um, so I'm familiar uh, with open science and open data. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with the evolution, you know, of, of this um, approach. And I'm really happy that uh, now in 2022, uh, we are open to open science. Uh, we are happy to share data. Um, however, there are challenges um, which is good to be aware of. Uh, and today I will try, you know, to translate uh, my knowledge um, to you. Um, if I miss anything, as I said at the beginning, uh, please just ask and uh, we, I will try to provide uh, you with answers. Um, OK, maybe just yeah, for, for your information, I'm a computer scientist. I work in the uh, field of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, and I'm also somehow connected with evolutionary optimization uh, so that you know that I'm more a technical person. Uh, however, the principles are more or less uh, the same in all um, uh, science disciplines. Um, so today in this lecture, I will try to discuss um, what is the main aim of European projects, uh, why these European projects are so data driven. Um, I will try to explain very briefly what is the distinction between data and metadata, because it's really good that you understand um, these concepts. Uh, I will also touch uh, a definition of deep data uh, and then we will continue um, with a presentation on how to prepare data to become open. Um, we will mention a few open data strategies and then we will conclude uh, with a very brief discussion on our perception of open uh, data because this is also very important. Um, it's good that we have all these principles, we have all the technology which supports uh, data sharing, but if we are not happy to share data, then <laughs> all these concepts and strategies won't work. Um, so yeah, this is more or less all for today. Most probably, I mean, I checked the agenda uh, and I noticed that uh, you had several interesting presentations and also in the following days you will hear um, a lot of interesting um, things about open science and open data. Um, so hopefully I want to repeat myself uh, with other presentations. Um, yeah, as I said, I'll do my best um, to make it, let's say, original. I don't know how many of you are already involved in European projects. Most probably, yes. Uh, but uh, if you continue to be active in the domain of science, 
uh, sooner or later you will become part of some project, some international project, European project, and it's good to know what are the rules. So from my understanding, the main aim of any European project is to join forces of different research groups coming from different either geographical regions or disciplines and try to collect as many data as possible to find answers to open questions. Nowadays, it's really difficult to find answers to any scientific questions without data. And because we have very strong technology, why wouldn't we use uh, use it um, to first collect data, then share it and finally use it, reuse it um, to find answers to our questions. Uh, we also shouldn't forget about the fact that these data are collected and prepared in different ways, in different formats, um, yeah, also using all kind of classification description systems, which makes reusing of such data uh, very difficult. Imagine in one study you collect pictures, in another study you collect signals, in the third study you collect text. OK, how to combine all these data? It's not easy, but technology luckily is developed well, so we can do it. Um, yeah, as I said, data is important because we want to find answers to open research questions and having high quality um, data um, sooner or later, we also manage to find an answer. Data is not important only for scientists, but it's also very important also for others. Here you can see some statistics PubMed, the library of medical um, knowledge. Uh, they provide very nice um, interface and also statistics. And this statistic says that daily users, okay, one fourth uh, of daily users are academics. However, very large percentage, 40 percentage of users are citizens and then others are companies, policymakers, and so on. I mean, to me, it was really interesting, this fact that such a big <laughs> percentage of users um, are coming from citizens. And nowadays, citizen science is also very important and should be part of open science. So when we prepare data, when we prepare the scientific information, we also need to consider that readers, users of this information may be people who are not experts in our field. So we need to work with reliable data. We need to prepare the information in such a way that not only it's understandable, but it's also replicable with others. Um, yeah, the question whether we shall share or not share our data. I think we all know the answer. It's really, how to say, fair <laughs> that we are open and that we allow our data to be shared and reused with others. The answer is simple, but to prepare data so that it can be um, usable also by others, it's not an easy task. Um, here I'm saying research is expensive. Yeah, usually it's very expensive and it's almost impossible to collect enough data only by one study or sometimes even by one project, even big project, European project. So let's collect data, let's prepare data so that we can start combining, integrating data from different sources and then we can be really strong. Um, so somehow intuitively we can say more data, better data, but in fact 
more data, big data, doesn't mean that this data is very good data. Sometimes it's better to have a less quantity of data, but this data is of high quality and high integrity. I mean, obviously we want to have more and more data, but the quality is also very important. Um, nowadays, this term deep data uh, is already very well established and means that these data has, you know, deep meaning, are of high quality and high integrity. Um, we have several questions. Yeah, once we start collecting data, uh, we have some technical questions. First, how to achieve high quality and high integrity data. Second, what to do to make these data shareable. Then, very important, we have also legal and ethical, ethical questions. This is out of the scope of, of this lecture. I also noticed that uh, you either already had or you will have um, a lecture on that. I really suggest, strongly suggest that you attend it because it's really, really important question uh, to be addressed by any scientists, especially in this era of data when it's easy to collect data. But, you know, once you start sharing data, you really need to be cautious um, about sensitive data. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, also the scientist's perception um, is very important. Yeah. Um, if I would be with you, I would ask you um, what's your opinion about the distinction between data and metadata. But because I'm I'm online, I will skip this part and I will I will continue um, describing uh, what's the definition of data. I mean, data. We all have a feeling that we know what's data, but usually we are not aware that data are facts, and without knowing a context of this data, it actually doesn't have any meaning. Here I'm giving an example of facts like F or M or, I don't know, 25. These facts may mean anything. 25 can be temperature, can be weight, can be height, whatever. So we really need to specify context of our data to become, I mean, to make this data usable so by others. So we say that, OK, we have facts, these are data. Then if we specify context of this data, we can start talking about information coming from this data. And once we have enough of these pieces of information, we can create knowledge. And without knowledge, obviously, we cannot make informed decisions. So all these steps are very important. And how to define context? We do it by metadata. So each data needs to be enriched with metadata. And then we have two big major types of metadata. The first group is related to data origin. We need to specify who is the author, at what time, I don't know, at what place this data was collected and so on. We say uh, this is uh, data provenance um, data. And then other major group of metadata um, define the context, which I mentioned before, the context of data. We describe the methodology, we describe, you know, all specifics which make data really uh, usable. And because, yeah, Nowadays, more or less, we deal with um, data in digital form. Uh, it's very useful to have technology which would define this metadata also in an automated way. Um, and if this is done by using technology, we say that data are annotated. Um, and this annotation 
should follow specific standards, uh, specific semantic resources, which are also called um, taxonomies, ontologies, and so on. So we could make a separate lecture on that. Uh, but um, these researchers, which work um, in any coordination, collaboration with computer science, are aware of these concepts uh, and should follow them. I mean, when you start, you know, designing a study uh, and you think about data that you would like to to collect, it's also nice if you have some standards on how to define and then collect data. So the data are collected in similar ways and then integration of data coming from different studies can be done in a much, much easier way. OK, so hopefully now you distinguish between data, data and metadata and both groups are very important. And sometimes, you know, you have repositories which provide information only about metadata, but even this information is of high importance. For instance, you have a repository of publications produced by specific authors, specific institutions uh, on specific topics. These are all metadata. And then once you find um, the resource, you are, you know, um, um, transferred, then uh, you are uh, lead um, further to the resource of, of main um, data. So, yeah. Um, Let's go back to our technical questions. Um, I mentioned that uh, once we decide to make data open, we have several te technical questions. We, can, we have uh, legal and ethical issues to be discussed um, and then um, other perception related um, questions. So regarding the, the technical questions. I mentioned that it's really important that the data are of high quality and high integrity. What does it mean? Um, it means that data should be as complete as possible. Uh, and this is something which you need to consider from the very beginning of your study. Then data should be completely accurate. You know, it's not very helpful that it's accurate only in some aspects, but in all of them. Um, and this data curation requires a lot of time, a lot of efforts. This needs to be taken into account again at the beginning of the study, because you need to consider this fact. You will spend a lot of time for data curation if you want to make it uh, of high quality. Data should be consistent. It means that um, it's not good that you collect data only about, I don't know, girls, if you want to consider also some aspects related to boys. You need to consider, in this case, both genders. So you need to be consistent in the data collection. And then what's also very important uh, nowadays data should be also immediately actionable. Um, it means that you, you remember I mentioned in some study you collect, I don't know, pictures and in, in another study you collect text. Uh, you want this information to be merged, to be linked as quickly as possible if you want to make these data useful. You don't want to make, you know, data open and then others will spend ages to make this data compatible. So this is also something uh, which is usually considered in advance. Uh, and it's very related to European projects nowadays, more or less in, I won't say in all projects, but in the majority of projects, this interoperability and standardization issue is addressed um, in, in the project. So if you are not from this field, it's really good that in such a project you connect with partners who deal with this issue. Um, all these 
questions related to uh, quality and integrity um, are covered with so-called FAIR principles. Um, once you are part of European project uh, funded by European Commission, this is a requirement, this is mandatory that all data collected in a project, in a European EU funded project, is prepared so that FAIR principles are followed. Uh, FAIR means these data are findable, um, they are prepared in such a way that not only humans can read it, but also information systems. Um, then it's accessible, means that data is, um, is um, stored uh, to be open access. Uh, it can be downloaded uh, from some open uh, data um, repository. Then it's interoperable, means that it's um, stored in such a format that it can be integrated also with other types of data and reusable. So regarding these FAIR principles, um, I suggest that you also check the European project uh, named uh, FAIR SPARE, where you can find a lot of information on this aspect. Um, I'm sorry, but one hour is really not enough time, you know, to go more deep into these questions. So I will mention everything that you should be aware of once entering or proposing a European project. And then if you have any open questions, you can contact me also later by email and I can help you as much as I can. Um, another Technical question um, is related um, to share data. Let's say that uh, we are happy with our data. Data is prepared so that it's of high quality and it's highly integratable. Uh, but now we come to the question, you know, how to actually share data. Um, it really depends first on the project and second on your institution. Uh, if your institution requires all data um, to be stored, uploaded to the institutional data repository, then you should follow their rules. Um, in again, majority of European projects, this is defined from the very beginning, actually, already when the project is proposed, these aspects need to be described in the project proposal. So there is data management plan, which is mandatory. And if you are new to any project, I suggest that you read first the DOA, the document of actions, the grant agreement, consortium agreement, uh, because there everything is written. If you cannot find this information, in majority of European projects, there are data managers, persons who are responsible for data management in a project. So you should contact him or her. Uh, and if you don't find yeah, the information, then the last step would be to contact scientific coordinator and then they are responsible um, for, uh, for you and I'm pretty sure they will help you. Um, we have several um, um, trusted uh, data repositories. Here I'm mentioning uh, Zenodo, which is uh, part of Open Air project. Um, it has been established by CERN. Uh, it's also supported by European Commission, so it's very um, well established data repository. Uh, what I find really interesting with this repository is that they also automatically assign digital object identifiers, DOA, which is for researcher important. Um, because, you know, when you publish a paper, you receive this DOA and you receive some credits. Uh, but, um, you know, 
most probably you have spent a lot, of, a lot of time in collecting and curating and preparing data, and you want to get also credits for that. Uh, and here you instantly receive DOIA, which you can then use as these kind of credits. Um, then regarding the open science strategies and policies, each country, each institution, European Commission, and also each European project uh, follow specific standards. So I suggest that you somehow find information about these strategies which are related first to your institution and then next to the project. Uh, if you are a student and you have a supervisor, um, my suggestion would be to, to talk to him or her about that. Uh, also from the beginning of your um, study, of your research work, because um, the rule is that you publish um, yeah, all these uh, research results um, as open access as soon as possible. Um, yeah. OK, let's continue. Um, maybe. Yeah, I can replicate here. Myself, my I can repeat myself that open science is a broad term. Most probably you have already discussed that in other um, presentations, in other lectures, um, and it's much more than just open access to publications or data. It's also related to citizen science, uh, to way of thinking, to way of collaborating. Um, yeah, it's, as, as, as the term says, it's openness. Uh, openness to way of thinking. And personally, I believe that uh, this is the best way to make progress um, in science because with collaboration, we can just profit. Um, but yeah, there are also challenges, as mentioned before. Um, all these infrastructures, repositories where you store or donate your data should also support this interoperability so that you don't have too much um, work. Um, you shouldn't care about all the aspects. You shouldn't care about the interoperability of your data with other data. This is the task, you know, of these platforms. Um, yeah. Um, another project which I believe is also uh, very interesting. Um, it's called um, red3data.org. Um, uh, uh, there you can find all the data repositories um, uh, used nowadays in different European countries. Um, and several years ago, not many of them, in Slovenia we had two or four open data repositories. Nowadays we have, let's say, a dozen of them. Uh, the number um, is increasing all the time. Um, I checked also University of Maribor uh, has its own data repository. Uh, we have the National Repository of Research Institutions. So there are many of them and you should really check either with your supervisor, with the scientific coordinator or finally with your librarian. Uh, which repository uh, is the best one uh, in your in your case? Um, I mentioned open science strategies and policies. Obviously, we have a national um, so-called resolution. Um, most probably, my presentation will be shared with you. Therefore, I added links to this presentation, uh, which are clickable, and then you can instantly um, come to the websites where more information is provided. Um, I'm also guessing that you are strongly related to University of Maribor. Therefore, I'm providing in my presentation 
a link to the open access policy for research infrastructures um, agreed uh, by, um, by University of Maribor. Uh, we have very strong uh, U European Union's uh, open science uh, policy, which obviously uh, also needs to be considered um, assuming that you are part of some European project. Um, I'm mentioning here on this slide also European Open Science Cloud. Um, this is in, an initiative and big project which is still in development. Um, it's aimed for storing uh, and integrating different kinds of data coming from different um, research fields. Um, my group is uh, strongly involved in so-called Food Nutrition Security Cloud project, uh, which is preparing all this infrastructure and technology for integrating data uh, coming from the fields of food and nutrition. But there are several other uh, projects, initiatives, uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, very soon this European Open Science Cloud uh, will become a central point uh, for, for not only storing, but, but also searching um, for data. Okay. Um, assuming that you work as a researcher, uh, you want to collect data, uh, you are obliged to prepare this data as open, you should follow specific steps. My suggestion is that you start thinking about that at the very beginning. I've seen so many studies and projects where they realized that data were not collected in the correct way and if they would have another chance they would <laughs> collect this data in a completely other way. Um, so I'm pretty sure that it's worth spending you know some time at the beginning, not rush, but spend some time discussing this question with other colleagues uh, with your supervisor, um, check the data management plan, which, as I said, is mandatory in any European project. Um, and once this is clear, once uh, you also know what are your institutions and the project's uh, internal policies and rules, um, again, as I mentioned before, you should check also grant agreement and consortium agreement. These are very important documents of each European project, um, then you should start working. It's also good if you have any chance to attend um, any, any workshop on that. Uh, it's also, especially if you are new to the, to the research domain, uh, it's worth taking such a course. Um, at our governmental uh, website, opsi, uh, podatki .go .si, um, uh, they publish uh, regularly information about these kind of courses. Uh, so maybe uh, it's, let's say, it's good advice to check this site from, uh, this site from, from time to time and if possible, attend uh, any of such courses. Then regarding metadata, data provenance, um, follow standards. There are many standards nowadays. Here I'm mentioning Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Um, this is initiative which defines the DOIA, um, the Digital Object Identifier, um, which we are familiar with uh, when we talk about publications, but when we talk about data sets, not many of data science, I mean, not, not, not many of um, researchers uh, are over, aware of these kind of standards. So check so that you will, you know, collect all the information that is required. Um, fair sharing uh, uh, .org, uh, this website, it provides a list of standards 
which are domain specific uh, because maybe you work in some specific domain, I don't know, social science or any other science, and there you can find information about standards that should be followed in your specific domain. So it's worth checking also this uh, website. And as I said, if you are part of the project, discuss this issue with project partners, because most probably, I mean, in many European projects, OK, you have seniors, you have senior researchers, but the actual research is done by students, by PhD or postdoc students, which are not experienced. And if you join the forces and uh, you discuss, you know, uh, with other PhD or postdoc students working in the project, um, it's, I mean, it's worth. <laughs> Uh, first, you establish a new network and second, uh, you can learn uh, from each other. And then you should not forget about intellectual property rights. If you work with other partners on this data collection or data reusage, once you publish the results or any parts of this work, you shouldn't forget about uh, the IPR that can come also from other partners. Because uh, also if you are forgotten, uh, you won't feel very well. So this is important to know. Um, here I'm just giving an example uh, of an ontology which is used in, in my field. Uh, okay, I'm a computer scientist, but I work uh, strongly in strong relation with uh, nutritionists and food scientists. And in this field, uh, any study which is um, designed uh, to produce uh, data, uh, they follow um, standard, which is called strobe nut standard. It's an ontology which defines how this study, which parameters should be collect in such a way, in such a format. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that um, in your domains, these kind of standards also exist and it's worth uh, using them. Um, OK, let's assume that research has been done. You have collected data. This data is of high quality. Um, this uh, data um, it's now ready to be stored, to be shared with others. Um, the requirement uh, of European Commission is that these data uh, and any results coming uh, from the work on data is published as open access. Uh, An open access means that online access uh, to any scientific reusable information needs to be provided uh, free of charge to the end user. Uh, and because scientific information is a very broad term, here I'm listing all the forms of scientific information that you should consider uh, as an information. Um, these are not only articles and papers and uh, presentations at conferences. Um, this information also includes patents. Uh, it also includes all kinds of press releases, uh, technical reports, web pages, uh, and also software, um, maybe educational uh, tools uh, that you are developed, that you have developed, um, and so on. I colored software, source code, algorithms, data set, and so on as blue, because at this very moment, um, it is recommended by European Commission to upload, to store, to provide um, this type of scientific information as open access, but it's not mandatory. Other types of scientific information are mandatory to be published as open access, while data sets, software and so on are recommended to be provided as open access. So it really depends, you know, on your research. It depends on the type of data. Uh, it's very good that you share it, but you are uh, not obliged to do this. Uh, what's also important to know, um, 
open access doesn't mean that you just publish and then it's free to others and you don't need to care about the reviewing process. Open access also means that this peer review academic process needs to be followed. Um, and what's also important to know, uh, before publishing any, let's say, sensitive scientific information as open access, you can protect it. You can pen, you can first pen a patent and then you can publish it as open access. So in this way, uh, you are you are free also to make these steps which are needed for the commercialization of your results. Um, then, yeah, regarding the um, the possibilities of publishing as open access uh, European projects, you have three options. The first option is that you use institutional repositories you provide so-called green open access. Uh, it needs to be an online repository, um, uh, but it's institutional. While another option is so-called gold open access, uh, where you use a system like Zenodo or any other open data uh, uh, repository. Um, and uh, what's important to know is that you can claim the costs from European Commission only and only if you provide full open access. If this is not provided, if you publish something in a so-called hybrid um, uh, repository venue, then you will not be able be able to reimburse the costs. The third option, uh, you know, sometimes maybe you are in hurry, you really need to publish your results. Uh, you have always a possibility of publishing uh, your scientific information in the journal uh, Open Research Europe. The problem with this journal is that it, as far as I know, I forgot to check this morning, uh, but uh, last time when I was checking, uh, it doesn't have impact factor. So you store results which you believe are important to be shared with others, but are not so important, you know, for your research, because usually you really want to publish all results um, in, in journals um, where also impact factor is um, yeah, as high um, as possible. Uh, don't forget, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, um, because you are part of a team of a project consortium, first, I mean, if you have collected data in collaboration with others, inform others, discuss IPR, intellectual property rights with others, uh, usually you should give a prior notice uh, to scientific coordinator or data manager. Uh, they need to allow you to publish this data. And once you agree that this data or scientific information can be published, you shouldn't forget to acknowledge EU funding. If you forget to do this, uh, you won't be able to reimburse the costs. Um, so here I'm giving uh, a text, but you know, this disclaimer, um, no, yeah, I'm just giving a disclaimer, but regarding the acknowledgement, uh, you should check with the project manager uh, because you, also, you, you need to acknowledge uh, European Commission, but uh, at the same time, you also need to specify the number of the grant agreement. Uh, and if this is not provided, you won't be able to reimburse the costs. So don't <laughs> forget about this. Uh, and yeah, the last issue here, uh, you also need to provide a disclaimer that uh, this is uh, your opinion and not opinion. I mean, results published in this open access 
uh, scientific information is your opinion and not the opinion of European Commission. So these are the rules which you shouldn't forget about. Here, just for case, I'm giving you a checklist uh, because uh, from my very experience, um, we spend so much time uh, with research and then uh, we publish these uh, papers and scientific information uh, very late in the evening, uh, catching some deadlines uh, and then yeah, we simply forget about specific issues. So here is a list uh, which um, might be useful also, also um, for you because uh, in the majority of European uh, projects, this kind of protocol is used that first you, you draft the publication, then you ask for um, the um, permission to, to publish everything. You need to collect all kinds of comments so, and so on and so on. So you can check this and you can use it uh, if you find it uh, useful. Fair sharing, uh, check this repository uh, because here you can find um, a lot, a lot of interesting um, information regarding uh, fairness. Um, what's also important, um, I mean, these fair principles are interesting, uh, are easy to be explained in a theoretical way, but then once uh, you try to follow them, um, you do everything with the best aim, but then uh, you never know whether you have, you know, accomplished uh, all the requirements or not. So there exist various uh, fair data assessment tools, either in a form of a questionnaire or some automatic uh, tool. Um, I suggest that um, you again discuss, discuss in your project uh, whether they suggest to use specific tools. Otherwise, at this site, uh, fair sharing, you can also find information about these tools. And then, you know, you can check whether your data set really complies with these fair principles. Um, yeah. If you cannot find sufficient information or you are not part of European project and you just work just you work, uh, you know, outside uh, a project and you still want to follow these rules of open science. Um, here uh, is an example of um, my institution, Josef Stepan Institute, where I come from. Um, we need to inform our institution librarian uh, about any new um, uh, open access uh, publication. We need to share with them, uh, let's say, PDF document or any other um, documentation. And then they uh, care about publish, publishing uh, in COBIS secret system. Uh, and then they also provide all this metadata uh, in the, um, let's say, Slovenian uh, open air, which is European um, compatible repositories. Um, on the open air uh, website, uh, you can find a list of um, a Slovenian national uh, compatible data repositories. Um, so, but as in most cases, you are part of an institution. It's an institution uh, who takes responsibility of selecting a data repository. So my advice is that if you don't have a supervisor whom you could ask, you don't, you are not part of European project, then uh, go to the librarian in your institution and ask them. Uh, they will, they will, they will help you. Uh, OPSI, uh, this uh, website, Odpartipodatki Slovenia, uh, they also provide information about open air compatible repositories, because if you publish data uh, in this kind of repository, then the information is also uh, available at the European um, level. 
so it's worth using them. Um, here is just an example uh, of a repository uh, where you can find information about metadata, which I mentioned at the beginning of, of my lecture, of my presentation. Um, a Scopus is a repository of metadata where you can search using this metadata. You can find, in this case, interesting papers, and then you have links to the publishers where you can also access um, this, um, let's say, original data. Um, so metadata um, is really, really important. Data without metadata is more or less um, unuseful. Um, if, um, yeah, um, uh, as we discuss European projects, we also shouldn't uh, forget about the platform which is named Horizon Results Platform. Um, just yesterday, I had a kickoff meeting uh, in some European uh, project. Uh, there was project officer and she warned us about this platform. Uh, now it's really mandatory that all the results produced in any European project um, are exploited. Uh, so the rule is that in the first year after the end of the project, you try to find a way on how to exploit uh, your results, your data. If this is not done in this year after the end of the project, then you have another period uh, where you need to provide data in this Horizon Results platform. Uh, key results need to be provided there. And uh, through this platform, then all interested stakeholders can reach this information and this can discuss with you ways of exploitation. So nowadays, um, uh, all European projects need to care also about data exploitation. Um, so how to prepare data, it's important because sooner or later uh, there will be possibilities of data exploitation in, in one or another way. Um, maybe some of you will be involved also in the preparatory stage of European projects when a project proposal is actually uh, written, prepared. Uh, here you shouldn't forget that this data management uh, plan um, needs to be um, drafted. Uh, you need to mention all these open science and open data access uh, policies that uh, you are going um, to follow. Um, and this part is then evaluated as part of the excellence a part of the project proposal. Those who have been or will be involved in project proposing, you will know very well what is meant by excellence part. Um, yeah, and uh, be careful. There are specific work programmes uh, where they also require citizens to be involved in the project. Um, you know, when we propose a new project, we are so deep in <laughs> technical issues in our core idea that we simply forget about all these other aspects. And then we spend maybe just a few days uh, for refining these parts of the proposal, which is really pity because um, uh, a very large percentage of the award of the mark of the final score uh, comes also from these parts. So don't forget about uh, data management plan, uh, fair principles, uh, open access policies, uh, citizens, citizen involvement and so on. Um, yeah, I have two minutes more. Um, I will be quick to finish my presentation. Um, most probably most of you are aware of the ways on how to give contribution to open data 
Uh, for those who are not familiar with the rule, here I'm giving an example. Uh, let's say that data that can be shared is uh, this photo. Uh, here you need to clearly specify um, who is the owner of this data and how this data is licensed. And this license needs to be, um, how to say, you need to provide a link to the site where more detailed information is provided. Um, so once you share data, you specify the license, uh, the copyright uh, rules uh, which you require, and then the persons who reuse your data um, need to follow um, this, this license. So don't forget about that. Um, yeah, final minute. Um, as I said, nowadays open science is mandatory, uh, but regarding our perception, I will give you just a few um, results. This has been uh, published recently, I think in a Nature's uh, um, article. Here you can see that the attitude of researchers is positive when we when we offer data as part of some appendix of an article, uh, when we are willing to share data with uh, close uh, colleagues, uh, but um, when we need to share data with broader community, um, the attitude of researchers is not as high uh, as um, yeah as it would be um, expected. But you can you can check these um, statistics later for yourself. Um, what's the main issue uh, is that scientists uh, are worried about the quality. Um, they, um, they, they require more training on these topics. So the problem is not that we are not willing to share data. The problem is that we are afraid, you know, of making any mistakes. Um, and yeah, therefore also uh, these days um, are organized by University um, of Maribor. OK, uh, this is my last slide here. I'm providing uh, my contact, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, anyone who is interested in more details, um, you are welcome to contact me. Uh, I will help um, yeah, as much as possible. And with this, I'm finishing. If you have any questions now, I don't know what's the time schedule. I think that we have time for two questions, maybe three, if they're short. Any questions? Well, I, then I go with that. Um, you were um, speaking at one point about open methodology. Um, could you maybe like uh, just say a little bit more about that, like what's meant by open methodologies? Um, okay, it really depends on the discipline, you know. Um, in computer science, um, we have uh, used these open um, methodologies for ages. Um, source code um, is shared among uh, programmers uh, now for decades. Um, and it's your very useful concept. I mean, um, we upload this open source code uh, to specific uh, repositories and then any new programmer can reuse it, refine it and then share it uh, back with, with others. So this concept of open working, open science, um, I think it's productive. Um, you still, you still, you know, meet some person who says, OK, but I don't want to share my code. Uh, I don't want others to see 
how uh, am I uh, working, but uh, if you imagine that at this very moment, thousands of programmers can work on your code and refine it and deposit it somewhere so that others can use it. I mean, this concept is amazing. So I'm not sure if I answered to your question. Um, for me, it's difficult to imagine how to use this concept in other fields. Uh, but in computer science, yeah, to me, it's so normal that um, I even cannot imagine working without that. You know, nowadays, the majority of code is designed in such a way that you take some existing library, you, you refine it, you add your part, and you focus on the part when, where you are really good. <laughs> you don't do your work from the scratch. Um, most probably also in other fields, uh, this concept can be used, but maybe in your room there is any other researcher who can share his or her experience. Thank you. Any more questions? Dyer? It was a long day. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. OK, I will switch off. Uh, I wish you a nice and productive afternoon. And I will share my presentation with the organizers so anyone interested in details can check um, later. Otherwise, I wish you luck with your research and with your European projects. Thank you. Bye-bye.